Hello and welcome. The co-op is thrilled to have Betsy Hill with us today for our webinar, How Your Child's Brain Works. Betsy is a neuroeducator and president of Brainware Learning Company. She has studied the application of neuroscience to teaching and learning with Dr. Patricia Wolf and other experts. Betsy works with educators, clinicians, and corporate trainers on using neuroscience research to address some of the most perplexing problems in education, including closing the gap for historically underperforming students. She addressed issues of college and career preparedness as a trustee and board chair at Chicago State University. She holds a Master of Arts in Teaching, an MBA from Northwestern University, and teaches strategy at Lake Forest Graduate School of Management and the University of Illinois Chicago. During the webinar, we will dig underneath the surface of teaching and learning to explore how information gets into the brain. After Betsy's presentation, we would love to hear from you. Please put your questions in the chat box and uh, we will try to get as many to as many as possible. Uh, however, uh, if you have any questions that you need uh, something clarified on, please feel free to put it in um, during, during the course of the webinar. I will be uh, keeping an eye on it and uh, hopefully we can get everything cleared up for you. Um, and so with that, I would like to invite Betsy to take it away. Great. Thank you, Kaylin. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited uh, to be here. I left one of the most important things out of my bio, however, which is that I raised three boys. And you learn a lot about kids and how brains work and things from doing that, although I did, it would have helped if I knew half of what I know today back when they were little. Um, but half the time, I think as parents, we feel we know exactly what our kids are thinking. Um, you know, those moments when you know they're thinking about taking that cookie they're not supposed to have or doing something else, um, and you just can completely read their minds. And then the other half of the time, of course, it's a black box. And so we're going to try and look inside that black box today. Uh, one of the things I did do is um, include a link to in the chat window. So if you find the chat window, there's a link that you can use to download a copy of the slides we're using today. So you're welcome to do that at any time. So here's our plan for today. We're gonna to talk about what is learning. You know, we're, we're all about teaching and learning and sometimes we um, need to take a little closer look and figure out exactly what it is we're talking about. We wanna talk about what supports or impedes learning. Um, and we want to talk about what's involved in remembering, because after all, if we can't remember something, we can't really have been said to have learned it at all. And it turns out that there are different types of memory. And sometimes this can be, understanding this can be really important for um, educators, including home educators, in terms of really creating the right kinds of learning experiences for our children. So, as we get started, what I'd like you to do is just to think in your own minds what you think a definition of learning would be. So if we met in the street and I said, hi, how are you today? By the way, what is learning? Um, what, would you, what would you say? You don't have to necessarily type it in the chat window, although you're welcome to do that. Um, and we can characterize learning a lot of different ways. I didn't give you very long, but... Um, you know, very often people think about it as acquiring knowledge or um, focused on content, whether we've covered and understand certain kinds of content or whether we have certain kinds of skills. In education, we tend to spend a lot of time on outcomes and how we can tell whether and how, uh, someone, how well someone has learned something. But what we're going to focus on today is learning as a biological process. So learning is actually the strengthening and creation of connections among neurons in our brain. The brain is a learning machine. It builds itself through experience. We interact with the world and that creates and strengthens connections among neurons and that are used in groups or neural networks or maps that are activated together. So when we hear something 
or do something as in any learning experience a network of neurons is activated and when that network of neurons of course neurons are the little tiny cells in our brains that communicate and so when we activate those um, we, that happens when we have that experience and every time we think about that experience that set of neurons will activate again so the more times we activate it in the same kinds of ways the more likely it is that they it will be easier to activate that neural network and this is a principle that the neuroscientists refer to when they say that neurons that fire together wire together so firing means they're activated they're actively sending messages to each other and of course they don't physically wire together but those connections among them become stronger and stronger and therefore when we activate part of that network and have a reminder of something then it's more at likely that that whole memory and that whole set of um, information will reactivate and that's exactly what memory is it's reactivating a network it's not a storage vault in the brain in fact it's not really a separate place at all there's no memory part of our brain memory is simply the ability to reconstruct or to reactivate previously made connections so the more we do that the stronger the connections and the easier to reactivate it so in a very real sense our brains become what our brains do and so our job as parents and teachers is to help our students build strong connections in their brains for the information and the skills that they will need to reactivate that learning later. So for the test, but ideally for a much longer time. So I want to jump on, we're going to do just a little bit of neuroscience today, and hopefully you'll find it as fascinating as I do. Um, and what we're looking at here is um, little um, images of three neurons. Our brains have about 85 billion neurons in them. Um, sometimes you will read numbers that are higher than that, but the latest uh, research suggests that it's about 85 billion, which is still a lot of brain cells. And they communicate at junctures called synapses. So the little space between the neurons is called that. So we're here see, right here, we're seeing three neurons. And each neuron has a nucleus. That's that little black spot in the middle of the um, neuron body. And then each, act, each neuron has one axon. And you can see that we have a diagram of one axon coming out of the neuron. And the axon is the part of the neuron that carries a message from that neuron to other neurons. Uh, the dendrites, you can see all of these little branching parts out on the rest of the cell body, are the parts of the neuron that receive the messages. So each neuron has about 6,000 dendrites, but just one axon. Dendrite comes from the Greek word for a tree. So you can see it's like the neuron's branches reaching out to receive information. Um, and they are just basically cover the whole cell body, 90% of the cell surface. So when one neuron is um, activated and caused to communicate with another, the space between, um, it will send an electrical signal down the neuron and at the place where it joins the next, or is close to the dendrite of another neuron, um, you can see a picture here, it's called the synapse. And what it does is it dumps neurotransmitters or chemicals into that space between the two and that's how they communicate. So it's a partly electrical signal and partly a chemical signal. And neurons talking together are the basis of all human behavior. So this is a picture of actual brain tissue, and it's enlarged many, many times. In fact, um, we've said that 80 mil 85 million neurons fit inside our, our heads, but 30,000 neurons would fit on the head of a pin. So we, you can't, can't see them unless you blow them up in a big picture like this. And so what you're looking at here, all the little black dots are the cell bodies. And then the, you can see the axons and the net, the, all the um, um, other, uh, the dendrites connecting um, in this profusion of connections. 
So there just are trillions and trillions of connections in our brains. And so what you're seeing here is actually layers of the outer part of our brain, which is called the cortex. So just imagine all of these neurons activating, transmitting signals electrically and chemically to activate or to calm other neurons. The brain is a very, very busy place. Uh, but our brains don't start off looking like this. And in fact, here are two more images of brain tissue from the cortex. The one on the left is, uh, this is a picture of neurons in a newborn's brain. And the one on the right is from a two-year-old. So babies actually have this, about the same number of neurons as we do as adults. 85 billion were born essentially with all of the neurons we will ever need with a few small exceptions. Um, and it weighs about a pound. And from the time that we're born, when it weighs like that, about a pound, um, it grows uh, really dramatically. By the age of five or six, of course, it's doubled in size and is 90% of its adult size and weight. But that doesn't mean that we get more neurons. What we get is more connections. And that accounts for the rapid growth and the, that amazing growth of the size of our brains. So in all of these connections, so you can see how much has happened between birth and two in terms of all those connections, that all comes from our interaction with our environment. The neurons form into networks in different areas of our brain so that we can hear and see and walk and grasp and talk and create a work of art and uh, do our math and um, everything else that we do. And in fact, what these, this, these two pictures show very graphically is what learning is. So when we say learning is creating and strengthening connections among neurons, this is a very vivid picture of that. Now, the brain has a lot more organization to it um, than just looking at connections among the neurons. And parts of our brain specialize in carrying out different kinds of activities. Um, of course, our brains are not all these pretty colors. They're basically uh, pretty much gray and white. Um, but they're highlighted here so you can clearly see um, which parts of the brain we're talking about when we label them as different things. And of course, you probably know that our brain has two hemispheres a right and a left, and each hemisphere is covered with layers of neurons, which are called the cortex. Uh, the term cortex is Latin for bark, and so it's bark the way that the bark is covering the tree, so the cortex covers the brain, and it's also sort of wrinkly like this. In fact, if you separate it out and could actually flatten it all out, it would be about the size of a pillowcase, a standard pillowcase, but of course it's all sort of crunched up um, so that it can fit inside our heads. The frontal lobes are a very important part. So if, if we are, um, uh, think about this as the brain, we're looking at it from the um, left-hand side where the front of the brain is on the left and the back of the brain is on the right. And of course there would be a, an equivalent um, set of lobes on the other side. Um, so the frontal lobes take up um, a large proportion of our brain. It's the big, biggest part of our brain. Um, and they're very um, important. We're much more highly developed in humans than in other animals. Um, and our frontal lobes control, among many things, consciousness, critical thinking, problem solving, decision making, planning, expressive speech, um, I like to think about our frontal lobes sort of as our stop and think lobes. It's what regulates us and helps us control, exercise control over our reactions and our self-regulation. We often think about it in that way. But it's also the ability to hold a lot of information and um, pull information from different parts of our brain. So uh, a very important place, especially when we start to think about um, critical thinking and decision making. Behind our frontal lobes are the parietal lobes. Those are that yellow part on this image. And they're responsible for touch, pain, and temperature. Um, they're also thought to play a role in our ability to calculate and to write. And they're also where we process information from other parts of our body 
so that we know where we are in space. So that feeling of how close we are to something or where our body, where our hands are and our feet are and in relationship to the rest of our body. That's what happens there. Uh, the temporal lobes um, are just above our ears and you probably can guess that in fact those are involved in hearing. Um, so, uh, as well as um, a number of other um, processes. And um, um, it actually includes part of our ability to, um, there are some actual language, parts of language that actually occur in that part of our brain as well, particularly our ability to manage uh, words and uh, that sort of thing, our lexicon. And then the very back of our brain is the occipital lobe, which seems sort of strange because that's where vision happens and where the processing of vision happens, despite the fact that the eyes are in the front of our head. Um, and there's a lot going on in our occipital lobes as well. Um, they do have a whole bunch of different kinds of cells. Some are motion sensitive, some are process color, some process straight lines. Um, and there's a very important part of the occipital lobes, which is called the visual association area, which actually matches up visual input with things that you've seen before and allows you to see whether it's a car or a person or a tree. Um, and when we start to think about our brains this way, then we can, and the fact that they develop in interaction with our environment. So we develop vision by seeing by taking in visual information, by interacting with it uh, physically in the environment. And that's how our brains actually um, evolve and develop the ability to see the way that we do. And so you may have had this experience where someone says to you, well, when you, you're looking at something, you say, look over there at the blah, blah, blah. And um, maybe it's a car, a person, or a tree. But maybe you're interacting and, and the other person says to you, I don't see that. And that's because even though it's perfectly clear to you, the comment I don't see may be literally true when it comes to processing what happens in our occipital lobes. So, oops, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about what it means when we say that neurons work together in, neuro, in uh, networks within these larger structures. So this is an image of a series of PET scans. Um, PETs is a kind of brain scanning technique where we can see the parts of the brain that are more active than others. So the areas here that are colored white or red or orange are the areas where there is the most activity. The areas that are green and blue have less activity and the areas that are black have even less than that. Now, one of the things I do want to say is that just because those areas are black and don't seem like they're active doesn't mean that nothing is going on there. There is something going on all the time throughout our brains. It's not that part of it's sitting idle. They're sitting ready and waiting, um, but there's activity going on actually and communication going on. It's just that these are the areas where there is heightened activity when we're doing certain kinds of activities. So that activity causes it to, to light up. And what we can see here is that the first one is when we're passively viewing words. So if you think back to what we were just talking about, the part of our brain that's in the back is called the occipital lobe. And so we would expect the activation of neural, neural networks in the back of our brains to be happening when we're doing that. When we're listening to words, we can see that activation more in the temporal lobe where we're hearing it and we're also associating those words with their meanings. In terms of speaking words, we're at the very back of our um, frontal lobes, where it's an area called the uh, motor cortex. And that is what allows us to activate. Also, when we're speaking words, when we're producing speech, we use the, the, that bottom part of it is an area called um, Broca's area, uh, which is actually responsible for speech. And then when we're generating verbs, of course, you can see a couple of different parts of our brain that have to work together. 
So there are two parts that are active, but they're actually actively also communicating um, in terms of working within the lexical area of the brain as well. So, um, you know, these of course are not separate and completely independent parts, they're always working together. But it's sort of fascinating, I find it fascinating, to think about all the parts of the brain and all the different processes that have to do, be working together in order for us to do something as simple as um, say, thank you, or um, to just even look at a sign and figure out what it says. So this is important for learning for a number of reasons. One of which is that we don't transmit knowledge and understanding to our students and children. It's not like we take our information and transmit it to them. In fact, what each student's brain has to do is to construct the knowledge and understanding that they have of the world from the experiences that they encounter. So in interaction with the outside world. And all of those experiences that we provide for them and that they encounter on their own physically change their brains. I think it's a pretty awesome responsibility when we think about the fact that our job as teachers, uh, because learning is a biological process, is actually to uh, engender physical change in our children's brains. Okay, so we've done our neuroscience uh, to start with. Um, we've looked a little bit about neurons and how they communicate and how, what that means for learning and that muting, uh, learning is actually about those neural connections. So what I'd like to do now, and this will become probably clearer a little bit later why I want to do this, but I'd like you to take just a moment to write down a brief sentence or just jot down a few words to capture how you might explain these ideas to a colleague or to your spouse or to another homeschooling uh, family or uh, parent or teacher. Okay, so um, hopefully you've had time to at least jot down a few words and some thoughts about the key things that you would want to explain to somebody. And now we want to talk about, uh, we want to take a step back from the neurons and talk about the processes that we go through from getting that information in through our senses to actually encoding it in long-term memory. And this is a simple model of how information gets into our brains and how we learn it. So as we've talked before, we talked about all the different senses and how they come into our brains. Um, our eyes and our ears and our taste buds turn information into electrical signals and that those activate neural networks in our brain. And most of the information that we're exposed to uh, is we're just exposed to way too much information for us to actually take in. So the vast majority of the information we're exposed to is instantly discarded. It never even makes it into uh, a place where we, could, we recognize it as information. And our brains decide what's important and then hold on to the rest. So if our brains decide that something is we, that we really need to know about or think about, then we will take that information and we will process it in working memory. And working memory is a cognitive process. Um, it's also sometimes referred to as an ex one of the executive functions. But working memory is where we hold information in our minds while we actively work on it. So it's sort of like a work table. So if you had a work table in the kitchen um, and you were making a recipe, you would have all of your ingredients set out and figuring out how to move them around and combine them and do various activities with them. And that's sort of what we do in working memory, although obviously it's not physically putting things on a table. Um, some of the things we put on the table or that virtual table in working memory may be new information that has just come in through our senses and made it through that screening process. And some of it may be things that we're retrieving from long-term memory. So we might be bringing in um, information we already know about to compare it. But in any case, at any stage along here, before it gets to long-term memory, 
if it's not transferred and if it's not actively worked on in working memory, it will be forgotten. Working memory is the only conscious processing we have. So sometimes we have to assemble a lot of information when we're thinking about a complex problem. But if we don't think about it there, we don't elaborate there, we don't work with it, then it's just gonna go away. And so very often, when we think we've um, explain something to our children or they've been exposed to some information or we've asked them to maybe do something, if they don't uh, think about it actively in working memory, that information will just be gone. And so when we wonder why they don't remember it, this can be a big part of it. So there's some principles and some practices that we can look at in terms of making that process work more efficiently and making those connections among neurons stronger. So I'm sure uh, with your experiences, you can probably already name some things that you know you can do to help your, your children and your students uh, learn better or build stronger neural networks. You may not have thought about it in that way, but you know some techniques that work and that have helped them build stronger memories. And if you wanna share some of those ideas in mind in the chat window, that would be great. And what we're going to do now is focus on four principles that really can help us organize these techniques and think about them in a little bit more structured way. After all, that's going to help us in the learning process and our brains are still learning too. Um, so the four that we want to look at here are um, connection to prior knowledge, relevance and meaning, emotion, and the role of rehearsal and practice. So as we go through these, think about some of those ideas and strategies and techniques for helping children learn things that you thought of and whether they fit into one of these categories. So first, let's talk about prior knowledge. As teachers, we should always be thinking about what students already know about a new subject area. So let's take an example. So I'm gonna show you a picture here and ask you to think about what you see. So you can look at this image. If you wanna type it in the chat window, that's great. If you just wanna think about it, that's fine too. When I do this and, uh, and I'm actually monitoring the chat window, I see all kinds of answers. It looks like people are making some comments. So did you see a dog? Maybe some of you did, and maybe some of you saw some other things. I've heard the seashore, I've heard a clown, I've heard a cat, I've heard an alligator, I've heard all kinds of things. It actually is a picture of a Dalmatian dog, but if you saw something else, you were not wrong. Your brain recognized a pattern that was familiar to you as something else. The point is that we see things that we're familiar with that match up with those models we have of the world and the information and the images that are already sitting in our brain. And once we see something, it's very hard to unsee. So even if you didn't before, you're probably looking at this and now you can see it even without the, the Dalmatian, without the lines drawn around it. So the patterns that we recognize become our model of the world. That's the information that's sitting in our brains that we compare everything else to and that we try to fit it into. So there's a network of neurons in our brains that represent dogs, the sights, the smells, the sounds, any other facet of dogginess that, that uh, whatever. And when we think about that, those net, that's the network of neurons that is activated. So now let's say that suddenly, um, instead of living on Earth, we find out that we're on Mars and it's time for the unit on dogs in our um, curriculum. But on Mars, there are no dogs. So if you show them this picture, or in fact, any other picture of a dog, do you think they'd see a dog? Of course not. Information has no meaning unless we have some experience to relate it to. If you think that story is a little far-fetched, I want to share a little uh, experience that I had with you when I was a little girl. I think I was probably three or four years old, and my parents took me with them to my father's boss's house. I don't know why that would have been, but they had a dog. And as soon as we walked in, I saw the animal and I said, oh, look, mommy, a cow. So I hadn't had any experience of a dog. I had seen probably pictures or maybe I'd been to the zoo and seen a, a cow. I don't know. 
But in fact, sometimes it's important to teach our students about something they have no prior experience with. And then we have to approach that in a little bit different way than if we, they do have some experience with it. And this reminds me of one of my favorite examples of prior knowledge. This picture came from a second grade teacher in Iowa. And you can see um, the, there are cows in this picture. There are obviously three cows with one of them standing behind the other one. So we can't see all of it. And when this teacher, however, asks the, the second grade students about uh, this picture, uh, most of them were very literal. And they said there were two cows, one of which had seven legs. And so the teacher asked the children to explain the picture. And they came up with a variety of very interesting responses. So I'm gonna share them with you. And as I do, think about the child's experience, what their prior knowledge was that would probably give rise to this interpretation. So one child said, the cow on the left is a real cow. The one on the right is a costume with an extra person in it. Another child said, the cow on the left is a real cow. The one on the right is twins. That is like conjoined twins. Cow on the right has a birth defect. The cow on the left is an American cow. I guess the cow on the right is from another country. So things that seem obvious to us because our neurons are connected in a certain way and we instantly recognize them as something are not necessarily going to be perceived in the same way for others. And we're gonna see the same thing um, and explain it in very different ways. <clears throat> so if students already have some prior knowledge about something, obviously we wanna find the experience that they've had and hook the new information to it. That is what we're really doing is we're connecting neurons with this active information about something new and we're finding an existing network of neurons to attach it to. If they don't have that experience, basically what we need to do is to create the experience with them. So one, of, one example of um, connecting an experience to prior knowledge is the use of a metaphor or a simile. And that's what I did when I explained that dendrites are like the branches of a tree. So that gave you something to connect it to and we could be hooked into a network that was already existing. If I can't do that, so for example, let's take ourselves back to Mars for a moment where there are no dogs um, or the children have never seen dogs, how would you create that experience for them? So you'd want to bring in a dog. You would let them pat it and smell it and play with it and experience uh, a concrete experience that they can then um, hold with them that where they're, they're building that um, memory that will enable them to have that understanding in a way that is uh, real and meaningful. Speaking of which, we now want to talk about the importance of relevance and meaning. And to do that, I want to simulate uh, the introduction of a new topic. And we can pretend we're in a classroom or in our homeschool classroom. And what I, we're going to do now, um, class, is we're going to read this paragraph together. And then I'm going to give you an open book test. OK, so here we're going to read it. It is very important that you learn about Traxeline. I should have read the title, The Montillation of Traxeline. Traxeline is a new form of Zionter. It is montilled in Seristana. The Seristanians gristeriate large amounts of Fevon and then bracter it to quasal Traxeline. Traxeline may well be one of our most Lukai Snilaus in the future because of our Zionter lesselage. So, what is Traxeline? Very good, it's a new form of Zionter. Where is it montilled? Seristana. How do you quasal Traxeline? Well, you get steriate large amounts of Fevon, et cetera, et cetera. So everybody in the class gets an A on the test because you've just been exposed to this. But what kind of neural connections do you think you've made in our brains? Pretty much none. So if we actually wanted to teach Traxeline, if it was a real thing, we might want to bring some into the classroom or watch a movie about it or somehow experience it. Uh, Traxeline doesn't exist, but if it did, we would want to do things like show how it makes pizza better or um, any other kind of hands-on uh, relationship and connecting it to what we know about the world. 
So if we try to teach Traxeline, if we emphasize just memorizing facts over developing meaning, we'll find that that learning is very short-lived. So every time we encounter new information, we wanna make sure that we can connect it to an existing set of networks. And you can't do that for your child's brain. Your child's brain has to do that for itself because their networks and their understanding and their prior knowledge and their models of the world were developed by their brains interacting with the environment. So you can suggest things, particularly because you know a lot about their experiences, but that process of connecting it and actively thinking about it and building it is something that their brains have to do. Um, and if you can't find a network, if it doesn't make sense, it probably will just disappear. All right, the third principle I'm gonna talk a little bit about is that of emotion in learning and memory. We often think of, of learning as being a very um, straightforward, dry, factual um, kind of process that we learn, we memorize information, we connect it to other information, we analyze things, we're very rational. Uh, but the third, the, this in principle is really important because emotion plays a tremendously important role in learning. So what I want you to do now is to think back to second grade, first, second, third, some early memory that you have when you were about seven years old. And I want you to think about some event from that year. All right, everybody have something in mind. So I'm going to predict that that event was either very happy or very sad. And in fact, the odds are that it was probably the latter. It turns out that negative emotions put a very strong stamp on our memories. Um, but in either case, it was something that had emotion attached to it. So we remember things that have an emotional connection and emotional content. In fact, emotions are necessary for learning. Emotions add extra vividness. So we hear a lot these days about the negative aspects of emotion and stress um, and that kind of thing. And, and those in fact can impede learning. Stress is um, causes our bodies to go into that fight or flight mode and shuts down cognition to a large degree. But and so we don't want to have a lot of those negative emotions around because that's not going to be supportive of the learning process. But that doesn't mean that we want to avoid emotions altogether. In fact, emotions are critical. So that adrenaline that gets going when we are feel stressed or threatened is also something that is released in our brains when we feel excited. And so a certain amount of it can really enhance positive memories. So as you're thinking about the learning process and how your children are engaging with the materials that they're learning, what are some ways that you could really help them generate positive experiences? Uh, so because we know that that's going to create stronger memories. So I've been reading your minds while you're on this webinar and just kidding. And one topic, though, is that it's almost universally believed to be boring and dry is statistics. And if I have any parents on this webinar who are statisticians and find it fascinating, you'll just have to forgive the rest of us who perhaps haven't quite seen the magic of that field. But this is an example where we can actually imbue the learning process with emotion to make it very meaningful and very memorable. So there's a simulation um, that is called Food for Thought, and it helps students translate relatively meaningless statistical information about the Earth's population and its distribution of resources into a more meaningful scale model that they can understand and experience. This simulation works best with a group of students. So it might be um, an activity, maybe you are, have um, a number of children that you are homeschooling or, and involved with teaching at a time, 
or maybe you could reach out to other parents in your homeschooling network and get a group of kids together to do this. Um, it would be well worth the experience. And what it does is get them really to um, get a feeling for the statistics and also to understand how statistics can be used and how they affect us. Um, the other way to do this, of course, is sometimes we can do projects um, that are real life. So we might go and um, calculate and keep track of how many glasses of milk we drink in our family every week and how many on average or, you know, so we can get statistics on something that's very close to home. Um, as I started to think about other things you could calculate, one of the first things that came to my mind is how many socks disappear in the driver, dryer over the course of a year. And of course, that's another example of statistics. But this one is a little bit more, a um, little richer. So basically you use yarn that you tape to the floor and the classroom gets divided or your kitchen or your living room or your playroom or wherever you wanna do this. And it's divided into part proportionally sized areas for the six major world regions. Um, and I do have um, some information on this, some, some, some of the statistics um, that I can send to anybody if they want. And so, um, Kaylin, maybe we can keep track of anybody who would like to get that information because they'd like to try this, but you don't, you certainly can, are welcome to go look it up for yourself, but I do have it gathered together if that is something you would find interesting. All right, so then what we do is we assign students to populate each region, and you can do this just proportionately um, based on, you know, the number of students that you have, but if you had 30, North America would have two people and Asia would have 17 people. I don't know if we always, even as adults, think about that um, kind of uh, difference. So then what you would do is distribute matchbooks or some other token to represent energy consumption. Maybe peanuts, of course not if you have a peanut allergy, you would choose something else for protein consumption. Maybe little cubes of cheese or something. Hershey's Kisses for Wealth. Um, of course, if you had a chocolate allergy, you're not gonna do that, but something else that symbolizes wealth. And what you'll find is that students immediately get the idea of have and have not status when they see each person in North America would have 11 matchbooks, 11 peanuts, and 60 Hershey's Kisses, where every person in Asia would just have three matchbooks, eight peanuts, and three kisses. So making it real, giving them something ta tangible, um, they really can get important uh, concepts like the fact that unequal distribution of resources can be a source of conflict. Um, and the reason for them to pay attention to this information is that it's all of a sudden relevant to them and they're having their own experience. When the students make these discoveries for themselves, that aha moment sends a flood of dopamine, which is the neurotransmitter we associate, that is associated with feelings of pleasure, into the synapses in your students' brains. And dopamine helps make a stronger connection at the synapse, which is where our memories actually sit, and makes it more likely that the information will be retained. And it's more likely, of course, what that means is that that group of neurons will be reactivated later, later when we try to recall it. So the, the fourth um, principle that I wanna talk a little bit about is rehearsal and practice. And um, of course we know that, you know, we talk about practice makes perfect. We talk about the fact that you need to um, practice things to learn them, but all practice is not created equal. And in order to do this, I'm gonna do one little bit more other piece of neuroscience, which is to point out a little, it looks like a worm, I think, sir, uh, on this uh, chart, it's called the hippocampus. You may have heard of that before. But the hippocampus is a very important structure in the brain. Hippo is the Greek word for horse, and so they thought that this little structure looked a little bit like a seahorse, which is why it got its name. So if you took it in half, you'd see it way underneath the cortex, way down in the 
what's called the limbic system. This is where all of our emotions happen. And the hippocampus is right next to that. So the, how we found out what the hippocampus does, yeah, there it is, is uh, thanks to a, a man named Henry Meliason. And Henry was known for years in the psychology literature as HM. Um, and he passed away a few years ago, so we now know his real name. But he's an interest, very interesting story. So he suffer, suffered from epileptic seizures when he was young, and the condition was really debilitating. So when he was 27, the doctors thought that they could help him, and he under, underwent an operation, and they removed the part of his brain that seemed to be triggering and involved in these epileptic seizures, and the part that they removed was the hippocampus. So following the surgery, he, his epilepsy issues were relieved, but he had a new problem. He could remember things from his past, especially several years before the surgery, but he could not form any new memories. He could not learn new words or songs or faces. He forgot who he was talking to as soon as he turned away from them. He didn't know how old he was or if his parents were alive. And he never again clearly remembered an event such as a birthday party. However, he did retain the ability to develop some new motor skills, such as uh, becoming quicker at drawing a path through a maze. He wouldn't remember doing the path through the maze, but he could actually perform that more quickly. And then at one point he sprained his ankle and he learned to be able to use a walking frame. So researchers spent many years um, watching him, observing him, and testing him uh, because, and, and all of that work really led to an understanding that there are two very distinct types of memory. So one type of mem long-term memory is called declarative, and it is the knowledge and our life experience that we can declare or recall consciously. It's uh, your mother's birthday, what you had for dinner last night, um, all those kinds of things. Procedural memory are the skills and habits that we practice to the point where they become automatic or unconscious. So procedural memory, let's take that one first, um, are when we practice or repeat something over and over and over again. And when we do that, your brain eventually gets to the point where you, didn't have, you don't have to think about it. In fact, what it means is the hippocampus is no longer involved in the memory. It just is there in other parts of the brain. And so when you learn to tie your shoes, when you play a piano piece, uh, perhaps you remember learning to drive a car and how much you had to think about when you first uh, got into a car and had to pay attention to the turn signals and the brake and the accelerator and if you were like me a clutch and um, rear view mirrors and all those kinds of things. But now you get into a car and you don't even have to think about um, all of that and probably you get to wherever you're going without even thinking about that and sometimes wonder how you got there. So motor skills are great examples of some of these procedural types of memories. Declarative memory is um, knowing what. It's knowing things or um, uh, concrete events or memories. And there are a couple of different types. So people refer to semantic memory, which is uh, independent of context. So the fact that a table is a table is a table, although it may look different in different situations, we still call it a table, or we recognize people outside of their context. Um, they're this general knowledge that we've formed. And then episodic are their life experiences. So we reconstruct those over time as we remember what happened um, at the last movie you went to, or what happened when you, um, um, you know, took your last test maybe. So, um, Another example maybe is um, you need to remember where you parked your car when you go to the mall. Well, when you remember that event, you're actually reconstructing it and that is episodic information. But knowing what that parking ticket is on the car is semantic knowledge. You know what that thing means and what's involved in it. 
And the important reason to know this is that there are two different types of rehearsal that are involved in doing this. And in terms of procedural memory, you want to do something over and over. This is where rote rehearsal comes into play. Um, and there is definitely a place for that. We want to get very fluent at knowing left and right. We want to get very fluent at knowing math facts. We still need to understand our math facts. So there are two aspects of it. Declarative memory, so information about the Civil War or um, other kinds of uh, how to write a persuasive paper, um, involve elaborating or integrating the information and giving it some kind of hook hook back into those neural networks that we already know and creating chunks of reminders so that we can remember it. So what I've done here, and we don't have time to, you know, detail, talk about all of them, but you've got this list now. And these are different strategies that are very effective for elaborative rehearsal, for learning something that requires you to think about it, to actively rehearse it in working memory. Um, so reciprocal or peer teaching. Actually, that's a little bit of what I do when I ask you to write down how you would explain the concept of neurons in the brain to somebody else. When we teach something, we get better at remembering it. Storytelling. I told you the story of Henry Meliason, and I told you the story about my young self uh, thinking that the um, dog was a cow. So involving all of these kinds of things, hands-on activities, projects, reflect in writing, mind maps, maybe some of you are familiar with them. Here are a few examples that I really liked of mind maps that I, that I found online. Um, you know, you could do it about mind map about anything. Here's one about tennis. Um, analogies, um, this is another uh, wonderful example of how to make something real and connected to information we already understand. So most of us read the newspaper every day and it talks about a trillion dollars here and a trillion dollars there. And we really do not have a good concept of, of what it means. So this is actually, we can do this experiment together now. If you take a piece of paper in front of you and draw a line about four inches long and label the left $1 million and label the right end a trillion dollars and then make a mark on the line indicating where a billion dollars would be. Everybody got that? Oops, okay, I didn't have that in this presentation. It would be right smack up against the $1 million. Some people just put it in the middle, but it's not halfway. In fact, you have to have a thousand $1 million to get up to a trillion. And so that's why it, yeah, it sits there. So these are the kinds of, and you can find a lot of these on the web, experiments, um, analogies and other ways to give kids real hands-on experience with this. And many of you know this, I know that, that I encounter a lot of homeschooling parents who really focus on this because they know that um, often this doesn't occur in a, a regular, ordinary, boring classroom in a school. So just a few um, things to emphasis, emphasize about this and to sum up, the more elaboratively we rehearse information when we're learning it, the stronger the memory is. The more modalities you use to rehearse. So sometimes people talk about, well, my child is a visual learner, an auditory learner, a kinesthetic learner. It may be that they have preferences, but I can tell you that the more paths you give them to retrieve the information, the more likely it is that they will be able to retrieve it. So using a lot of different modalities in different ways with the same material is going to create a stronger set of neural networks. The more real world examples you give, the more likely will be understood and remembered. People don't learn irrelevant stuff. Um, it's when it's, they have to use it in everyday life that it becomes really meaningful. And of course, the more we can link it to prior learning, the stronger that memory is gonna be. So, I can also tell you that uh, practice, while well, we say that practice makes perfect, it actually doesn't. If we do it the right way, it might, but it does make permanent. So the more we practice things, uh, and the more we actually try to retrieve information. Um, so often I will ask students this, if I'm talking to a group of kids, and give them a choice. Okay, so 
how do you think it's better to prepare for a test? You're going to go over all of your notes so that the information is fresh in your mind and you make sure you've covered everything. Or do you test yourself or have someone else test you and then practice or repeat testing on what you missed? And I'm hopeful that based on some of what we've been talking about this afternoon, that the second one will obviously jump out to you as the best way to do it. It turns out that this kind of um, effortful retrieval, um, in fact, you can think about it is, um, it's not really a test, you know, you're testing yourself, you know, everybody hates a test or a quiz or whatever. Try calling it retrieval practice instead, because what it's really asking you to do is to actively retrieve the information, which is gonna, again, help to strengthen those neural networks and strengthen that memory. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we looked at today is learning is a biological process. All of this activity is happening inside our kids' heads and it's an amazing, wonderful thing um, to watch um, kids learn and grow is just an astounding. Uh, I loved it with my own children and I have two granddaughters who are just learning every single moment and it's fascinating to watch. And the fact that that's all happening in with the communication between 85 billion little neurons in our brains and that that's what we uh, remember things with. It's how we encode memory and it's how we retrieve memory and all those neurons that fire together, wire together. So we've covered a lot. Hopefully it's been interesting and you've uh, learned some things that you will find relevant and useful. And now I want to stop and see if there's some questions. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I hope you will all thank me in, or join me in thanking Betsy. I thought that was just absolutely phenomenally interesting. Um, so if you have any questions, please just go ahead and add them to the chat box. Um, we have one to start with, which is what is the relationship between procedural memory process in the brain and muscle memory? Ah, uh, that's a great question. And they're essentially the same thing. Um, so we, we use the expression muscle memory because we, it's something that happens and that we can do without conscious thought. And in fact, we want to have what we call muscle memory uh, when we're learning a sport or typing or things like that. We call it muscle memory because we're not consciously aware of our brain processing it and telling our muscles to do things but that's because we've practiced it over and over. There was a point before we had that muscle memory. So it's really brain memory, but it's brain memory at a procedural level where it doesn't have to be directed by conscious thought. So really one and the same, but great question. Um, excellent. The next question we have is how do we teach those with learning disabilities to train their own brains? Mm, okay. So that's a big topic. Um, so when we have kids with learning disabilities, what that means is that they have a weakness. Now they may be brilliant in something. So everybody has cognitive strengths and cognitive weaknesses. And cognitive skills are those mental processes that we talk about things like attention or visual spatial processing or processing speed and, and all that kind of thing. And so, when, we have, when somebody has a learning disability, what it means is that one of those or more of those skills is weak enough that it really can stand in the way of their learning to read, learning to do math, learning to do everything else that you want to do. And there are a couple of ways to approach this. One of which is when you understand um, what a child's cognitive strengths and weaknesses are, there are a ton of very effective strategies that help them support them in the areas where they need support. So it could be um, strategies like if you have a child with um, poor attention skills, then there are things that you can do like um, create a very quiet space, a very organized space, a very clean space without a lot of distractions for when they do their work. That's a pretty obvious example. 
So there are those kinds of strategies. And if any of you are familiar with the mind print cognitive assessment, um, which I know is available through the Homeschool Buyers Co-op, it's, um, it's a fabulous um, product, uh, provides both the, a thorough, deep understanding of a child's cognitive strengths and weaknesses, as well as um, the strategies and the, the learning plan that go with that. So really powerful. The other thing that we can do is we can um, actually Thanks. work on and strengthen. I'm sorry, was there another question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I just, I made a noise. Oh, okay. I just, I thought I maybe missed something. Okay. And the other thing we can do is we can actually work on strengthening. So we have done a lot of work um, in schools and with parents at home, um, helping them uh, help their children strengthen those. And because these are, many of these skills are things that happen at a non-conscious level, they're not the kinds of things you can explain to somebody. So for example, we're talking about working memory. Working memory is a big culprit in learning disabilities for many, many kids. They just don't have the, capa the same capacity as others their age do to hold information and manipulate it and think about it and put things together. So that's, and I can't explain to you how to put, hold more information in your brain, but we can develop it. And the Homeschool Buyers Co-op also offers our Brainware Safari program, which is exactly about that. And so if you need more information on that, I know there's a ton of great information on the website and would encourage you to do that. So there are really two approaches and they're not mutually exclusive. You can actually work on strengthening these underlying cognitive processes and building them so they're stronger and you can use strategies that the children themselves can own so that you and they are working together on the same kinds of things that will support their very specific learning style and needs. Excellent. Um, so we're, uh, we've run a little bit over time, so I'm just going to ask one more question before we close this out. And I know there are so many great ones out there. So I'm um, sorry for those of you who uh, didn't get um, your questions answered. Um, but our last question is, my child detests review and solidify knowledge and memory. Okay, so Kaylin was breaking up a little bit there. I'm not sure if everybody else was able to hear it, but what I heard was my child detests review, of course, because it's boring and um, something about solidifying knowledge. And so I wanna to say too, for those of you who have questions that you didn't get answered, I certainly welcome them. If you would like to communicate directly with me, here's all my, my contact information. So what I would say about um, review is that it is, it's, it's all in how you do it. And so you can turn review um, A part of it, I think, depending a little bit on course, help them understand sure. the stuff they already know and have down pat, but make sure that they're winnowing it down to the things that they really need so they can be very efficient and much more productive in their review process. The other thing is figure out a way to make the review process itself engaging. And games are a wonderful way to do this. So you can create, for example, um, if you're doing botany, you can do botany jeopardy and make it, turn it into a game. Or who wants to be a millionaire about, um, oh, I don't know, anthropology, whatever it is that they're studying and working on or life science. And the kids themselves can actually come up with uh, the, the questions, you know, getting them to think about what's a million dollar question versus a hundred dollar question or a $20 question versus a, you know, $800 question, whatever the, the tiers are. Um, uh, those are ways of making it a much more engaging process and reinforcing it and elaborating it. So reviewing by itself, if all you're doing is reading over your notes and trying to memorize them and study them, then they have, that information has no meaning. It has meaning if you're engaging with it and applying it and doing something that, um, that you, you know, is an enjoyable process. And if you can put it in a game format that 
um, that's a wonderful way to do it. So it's, I think, I'm not sure whether Kaylin has um, still got her connection or not. Somewhat. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, this has been such a delight. And um, I do, you know, I'm very passionate about this, um, helping people understand, um, you know, back when I was a high school teacher a million years ago and my kids were little, I didn't know any of this stuff because nobody did. There was no neuroscience. And understanding it and figuring out how it can really transform the learning experience you know the, the learning happens from the inside out not necessarily from the outside in and uh, when we understand that we can do some things to create those experiences for our kids which will result in really meaningful and lasting learning so i wish you all the very best with that and i salute all of your efforts as homeschooling parents you have taken on a wonderful wonderful journey Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that um, you can get Rainware Safari uh, on the, the co-op and it's a deal of the week. So it's 34% off and a smart point. So awesome deal. Um, and we will be uh, shortly sending an email to everybody who's registered for this webinar. Get the slide deck, some the, the resources that have been mentioned, um, and uh, anything else that we think will help you guys out. <laughs> so thank you guys so so much for attending, and thank you again, Beth. That's my pleasure. Thanks a lot. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their day. Bye.